Welcome to Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. A world where coming in second place is not an option, but where principle-centered winning is the only approach. Good morning and welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. I'm Hilary Fordwich from Key Solutions. The mission of our program is to give you, the government contracting community, the best possible information to help you win or retain contracts. In a moment, I'm going to share with you some exciting news that will allow us to take that challenge to a whole new level. But we're going to open today's program with an interview with Ed Morche, the Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Government Markets Group for Level 3. Ed Morche and Level 3 have attained a tremendous level of success even in the face of a very difficult market. Now for some big news. Key Solutions is proud to announce that we have entered into a content partnership with the highly respected firm of Centurion Research Solutions. And later in the show, you'll see a conversation between our own Jim McCarthy and Gary Lloyd, Centurion's president and CEO, about the very actionable information for you that they will be sharing with us in the coming weeks. There's a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. Good morning and welcome to our segment where we're talking to a local leader bringing us some great insights into federal markets. This morning I'm delighted to have with me Ed Morshe. Good morning, Ed. Morning, Hillary. How are you? Great, thank you. And Ed is with uh, Level 3 Communications. He is the Senior Vice President and General Ma uh, Manager of their Government Markets Group. So, Ed, I'd love for you to share with our audience something about Level 3 Communications and also how you're very different than all the other companies in your space. Sure, thank you. Uh, we are of the five large providers in the federal space. Uh, Level 3 is the only one that was never a local telephone company. Uh, so we're a 15-year-old company as opposed to our competitors who are all over 100 years. So you never had a monopoly? Never had no. a monopoly, right, thank you. Never people had, oriented, customer oriented. Never customer had a government focus. franchise. Uh, we're also a little bit different in that we don't run a wireless network. We don't have a consumer business. Uh, we're all about our fiber optic backbone. We're all about expanding that network and getting closer to our customers and taking our capital and sinking it into our customer base, specifically for the expansion of our wireline business. Uh, we're the largest IP backbone in the world. Uh, of the U.S. providers, uh, we are the largest domestically and internationally, and we think we can bring that scale to bear to benefit our customer base here. And you have a great reputation from, from what I've read and heard, that you have a great reputation for reliability, dependability, and great technology. Absolutely, and, that, and that's really what we do. Uh, we understand what we are good at. We understand uh, what our assets do for our customers, and we ensure that we stay close to our knitting and, and exploit those assets to benefit our customers and continue to innovate uh, in technology. We hold over 900 patents. Uh, we find that innovating and benefiting our customers through that investment in the network is the best thing that we can do for them. So you're not really trying to be all things to all people, like some of the yeah, other firms are. Absolutely. You haven't diluted your brand at all yet. Right. So you might, you might hear uh, in, in the marketplace or around town that uh, people want a, a bundled uh, service that they want. Bundle solutions. One, right. Yes. One throat to choke. It's easy. Technology is too hard. That agencies can't understand how to bifurcate their spend. We don't believe that. We believe that each provider should do what it does better than anybody else and not try and dilute itself by doing too many different things. And bring the technology into what you really specialize in. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Great. So inside the Government Markets Group, uh, I'm responsible for all of our uh, state, local, and federal business, direct and indirect, also our research and education business. Uh, so we've taken a slightly different approach than some other companies and put all government uh, at any scale into one organization and uh, are quite autonomous. It allows us to react very quickly to what government requirements are. And that's actually what the government wants, being nimble and being responsive. All of us need to take into account the current economic milieu, but what's interesting, I think, is to listen to people who have a vision and who really are setting a strategic direction for their firm. 
Ed is setting that strategic direction for level three communications. I know you're taking into account lots of the current contracts that you have. You have the WITS, the GSA regional contracts, and also mm -hmm. networks enterprise. So in light of those, can you give some advice to our audience as to what you're doing in terms of preparedness and readiness? Sure. So I think I have the luxury of having been in commercial for the last 15 years and in government for the last five years, so I can see both sides. Mm -hmm. um, we really reached out to our partners at GSA and said, look, we together have a responsibility to try and get government to operate more like industry. And that opened up a dialogue, and the question back to level three was, okay, tell us what those things are. Because they do want to succeed. They, they, they're not anti-business per right. se, right? That, yeah. That's right. And, yeah. and, I, and I think when people first come into government contracting, there's a view that government doesn't want to be like industry, that they have their own rules and they're happy with those. And that's not necessarily the case. Those rules came about for certain reasons, organic and inorganic. But everybody that we've worked with at the GSA has been very interested in finding out ways that they can do things better. That's phenomenal. That's great to hear. Yeah. Good to hear. Yes. So, so we focused on three recommendations. We said, look, the, the big GWACs or government-wide acquisition contracts, um, like Networks Enterprise, occur every 10 years. So we're about to enter into Network Services 2020, which would be the fourth of the big 10-year contracts. And, and there are a lot of problems with how that occurs. I'll get into that in a second. The other problem that we highlighted uh, for GSA was around mandated services. Mm -hmm. So government uses a service, they mandate that service be on the next contract, but industry may no longer want to service that type of, of operation or, or product, right? So we said, we need to get rid of that. Uh, the other thing And they was, were acceptable to that? Very open, yes. right? But the question's always about how. Mm -hmm. How do we change? And the last piece of input was around limited amount of competition. So if you look at the networks contract, there's five of us. Well, there are more than five providers in the U.S. Many. Right? Many. Yes. Dozens and dozens. Many watching. Right? Now, if they all have to provide certain mandated services, well, then we're really going to call the herd very, very quickly and end up with just five. Right? But people do niche services quite well. And we shouldn't make them do things that telephone companies did decades ago. Yeah. We should allow them to abandon those services if our commercial customers no longer want it and focus on what their commercial customers do want. Those services and those competitors need to make the way to the contract. And the 10-year the cycle around the GWAC needs to go away. What we, the big and they were, fine, that, that they were acceptable, accepting of? I, I, think, I think very accepting to the input. Okay. And again, the big okay. question was, well, how do we pull that off? Right? Government can't commit itself to more than a 10-year period. So in principle, they're there. In principle, they're good. there. That's the first step. Right. So our recommendation was the GWAC needs to be more like a commercial MSA or master service agreement. It should define the T's and C's of how we operate together. It should define you know, who pays what and what the flow downs are, but it shouldn't put a term limit on when something starts and when something ends. Which it doesn't in the commercial sector ever. That's no. right. That's right. So it should allow agencies to come in in year two or year three and purchase a service, and then for the next 10 years, they can have that, and they have to move on to the next solution and something else. That will create a situation where we have a lot of ebbing and flowing of purchasing and acquisition, as opposed to what we have today, which is every 10 years, everyone has to transition in from one vehicle step. to another. Yes. Right? And, it, and no. frankly, it's killing government and it's killing industry. So you know, not only is, are the agencies under pressure to reduce costs, but so are we in industry. And the last thing either one of us wants to do is hire an army of people on both sides to transition everything all at once just so we can lay them off at the end and send them home. Yeah. What we want to have is an even cost structure, an even number of people on both sides so we can help each other and not react to a political input around a 10-year vehicle. So it's a win-win situation. Absolutely. Win-win yes. for industry, win-win for government, and win-win definitely for the taxpayer. That's right. Yes. So there are a lot of issues that we know you love to hear about, and there's a lot of issues that people groan about. Um, LPTA, low price, technically acceptable, of course, has been an issue that um, causes a lot of people a lot of angst on the government mm -hmm. side and on the contractor side. And it's been viewed more now, more about really best value. That's what we're hearing from government. We've had a number of government officials on, and they say it's more about best value, and they don't look at it as negatively. How are you looking at it at Level 3 Communications? Uh, we don't like LPTA. No, no, no right. contractor so, ever has. No. no. Uh, so here's the challenge. I think that everybody would like to have a completely objective way to award a service and eliminate any possibility of protest. And that's part of what LPTA is about. I want to create a series of boxes, make everything an apples to apples comparison. So it's objective, very objective, very objective. not sub so subjective. Right. That, that's the best part about LPTA. The bad part about LPTA is that it takes a technology driven solution. It, you really, your agencies right now are asking contractors, be entrepreneurial, bring me something new, bring me something different. But at the same time, I'm going to use LPTA to commoditize what you're bringing me. 
So you, you can't create a, a, a cutting-edge solution and commoditize at the exact same can't time. Can't do both at the same time. Yes, right. yes. And so you need it too. Right. And, that, and so we, of course, are, are proponents of best value. And what we would like to see is five contractors show up to the table with five very different solutions and allow the agency to choose which one fits them best. And we'll all have a different um, take on what the right answer is. And it's good. It creates a dialogue for agencies. The challenge is we have to make sure that agencies have enough training for their procurement officers so they can make that kind of best value judgment and eliminate the opportunity for protests. And protests are increasing. Bid, bid protests are increasing and it used to become, it used to be sort of a, a negative to even contemplate um, protesting bid. Now it's become de rigueur. Yeah, it, it's not good. No. Uh, so I, th I think you find agencies are trying to find a way to get their procurements down below $10 million to avoid the protest threshold, right? They shouldn't have to operate that way. The procurements that are coming out, the awards that are coming out are delayed by weeks or months because there's an increasing paranoia on the government side that a protest will occur and they don't have the staff to handle a protest. No, right. Right? So, so it's creating a very negative incentive on the agency side. It's creating more angst on the contractor side because as we know the spend is coming down and whatever does get procured, everyone runs after. And that's also why they're increasing bid protests because people want to take anything they can and it can also right. extend, if you're the incumbent, extend your role there while you're still um, on the contract. That's right. Yeah. So if, if there's 10 people at the table and one stake hits the table, nine people are going to be on that. That's right, 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 right. And then also you mentioned about the, um, for the procurement um, personnel, uh, there's always the concern that there are, there are fewer of them, more are retiring, they're mm -hmm. less well, not well qualified, they don't have the expertise to have the intuition right. to judge. So LPTA is probably good for them because it gives them more of a structure in which to judge, but it's a perfect storm at the wrong time. That's right. And, and so I think what we have to have is a greater amount of investment on the agency side for training for those folks who are in procurement. So it's more money up front, but over the long run, the ROI is much greater for the agency. Yes, yes. Many of us have heard a lot recently about the um, prevalence of or predictions for a lot of M&A activity through to the end of this year. A lot of companies are stockpiling cash, purportedly so. So I'd love to ask, Ed, your take on that from the uh, level three perspective. Uh, have you stockpiled cash? I'm not going to ask exactly how much you have in the bank. <laughs> right. uh, but we hear this all the time from all the major companies. Sure. And what Apple has more federal reserves than uh, cash reserves than the federal government, I think. Yeah, so. yeah. good problem to have. Yes. Um, Do you have so, that good problem? Probably not to the extent that Apple does. Apple does, okay. Uh, but I'd say ever since divestiture occurred in the early 80s, you know, M&A has been occurring in the telecommunications space in North America, and it will probably continue for a long time to come. It, it, the issue is going to be around how many big companies are left. In the late 1990s, there were a slew of next generation companies that came out. Level 3 is an amalgamation of most of those next generation mm -hmm. companies. So in our 15 year history, we've had over 20 acquisitions. You've been through this a lot, yes. yeah. Quite, quite a bit. And Which is actually good because then you probably have a roadmap for and you have a process for acquisitions where a lot of companies don't. Yep, the, fir the first couple are hard, right? Yeah. And then they get real easy because you understand what the recipe is and how you integrate. Mm -hmm. And integrating uh, a company into your back office system is the most important thing to do after culture. Right? So yeah, the culture has to be the same. Uh, you can't have that kind of conflicting you know, oil and water between two organizations. They have to think the same, they have to have the same value systems, and then the back office has to come together. Our, our most recent acquisition was in October of 2011. We acquired a company called Global Crossing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know most of your uh, viewers, viewers have heard know. of that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. A, good, a good company. A, a good company. Yeah, absolutely. But it's the people issues always that there's some conflict with. But you're good right. at that. Right. We're good at that, yeah, and we're and we make sure that we identify people that have the same values that we do, so that mm -hmm. we can integrate very quickly together and, and inculcate that into them, so that they're absorbing and they want to be part of you. That's right. Yeah. So another company that was very focused on its own wireline business. You know, Global Crossing was more focused internationally. Level Three was more focused domestically, uh, and the two companies companies coming together created the largest of the U.S. providers. With great um, geographic presence instead, Absolutely. yes. So and when you look ahead to the rest of this year, do you see looking out in um, the environment, is, it, is there more certainty because of the sequestration and everything happening um, on the political side will create a sudden flow, like an avalanche of m and activity? So we, we've seen uh, fourth quarter of last year and first quarter of this year, a great hesitation for anyone to do anything. Right. And starting in March and April, we've seen kind of the floodgates open up, post-sequestration, post-fiscal cliff, and we think that that will further lead to other acquisition activity. And this summer, people are saying it's going to be a lot more of it. And when people usually go away and it yeah. gets a little quieter, people say it's going to be hot this summer. No pun intended. Yeah. Yes, it's right. Probably right. For M &A, yeah. yes. Probably right.
As you know by now, Key Solutions is the force behind Government Contracting Weekly. Key Solutions provides strategy capture and proposal support for government contractors to win contracts. So we're always interested in what you see are the keys for winning. At Level 3 Communications, you're focused on the federal markets, mm -hmm. you're winning, you're growing, you've been successful. So our audience wants to know how are they doing it? So what are right. your keys to winning that you view? So probably our first one is being that honest technology broker walking into an agency and talking to them about what their problems are and making recommendations that sometimes fit our core competencies, but sometimes don't. And when they don't, it's an opportunity for us to bring in teaming partners, mm -hmm. to identify somebody who may do it alone without us, but hopefully there's an opportunity for Level 3 to work with that partner as well. So it's a te integrity for the government, because you're not saying me, 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 us, 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 go with us all the time. You're just That's doing right. the best for them, which they really love. That's right. And that, and that may mean That's that there's not an order that month or that quarter, but over time you build a relationship with the agency where they trust you and they look integrity. to you for an answer. And they know that the answer is not going to be self-serving. That's fantastic. And when you're looking for teaming partners, we've got many members of our audience this morning might be thinking, oh, how can I team with Level 3? Right. What are you looking for, Ed, at the moment and, and forward and towards the end of the year? So our, our culture is that we focus on what we do best. You know, we're the wireline provider. We spend a ton of capital improving the depth and breadth of our network. We know what we do. We want partners who understand what they do. We don't want partners who say, yeah, I can fill any gap. I just want the revenue. We want partners to say, this is, this is what I do best in the Specialty, marketplace. Specialty, my niche. Right? My niche, yes. and I can help provide value. Right? And we want to walk in as a group of organizations, a group of contractors to an agency and say, together, you can't do any better. This is the than phenomenal this solution, yeah. Absolutely. So really, I would think also teaming partners should be very well aware, should study level three, should know what you're already offering so that they can spot some of those gaps and think about their specialty. No, nothing's better than a teaming partner coming to you with an opportunity. Yeah, so that they and they know That's about right. this, know about this. Is there anything else in terms of the keys that you've had and, and some of the keys to your success? I, I think it really comes down to relationship. You know, if if you have a, an honest relationship with the agency. Uh, and you can sit down and help understand their problem and provide valuable input to them. That's much greater than going out and trying to get on a bunch of IDIQs and Macs. It's much greater than trying to spread your BD and capture resources too thin and hoping that you can get new business. We believe that honesty, technology, transformation will ultimately lead to us getting more business. Yes, that trust. Yes, thank you very much, Ed. So just remember to really be focused in, focused on your specialty or niche if you want to team with Level 3 Communications. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. As I shared at the top of the program, Key Solutions is delighted to welcome Gary Lloyd and the professionals from Centurion Research Solutions to the Government Contracting Weekly team. Let's listen in on the conversation between Gary and Key Solutions' Jim McCarthy. I'm here with Gary Lloyd, the President and CEO of Centurion Research Solutions. Gary, welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. Thank you. Good to be here. We're glad you're here. Very happy to be we here. Really it's a are. great show. Okay, so look, I know uh, many, many of our viewers are quite familiar with Cent Centurion, but for, for those who are not, could you tell us a little bit about your company and then maybe how what you do is going to be applicable and a value to our listening or viewing audience? Sure, sure. Yeah. We are the leading provider of relevant business intelligence and in winning analytics, actionable winning analytics for the, for the industry. We couple that with professional services, wrap rate analysis, uh, uh, cost structure, um, financial readiness, competitive pricing analysis, those kinds of things. That's very valuable in a day where you've got to be very competitive and you're, we're looking to help our clients win more business in the federal market. Mm -hmm. Um, we've done that through some innovative products and services. So we provide these through a subscription-based services model, which means that we augment, we complement what our clients already have in place. We don't replace it. We're not a software company. Mm -hmm. We just augment it. You know, with that, <clears throat> I think when you look at the company, we brought in seasoned professionals. These, these individuals from uh, Northrop Grumman, Titan, BDM, CSC, Verizon, big companies that bring thought leadership to the table, that's been infused across the board in our service offerings. And um, that's made it really strong because these people, they've been there and done it. We carry a bag, we've won deals, we've right. pursued deals. Right. And um, when I acquired the company in 2006, we had about 100 clients, 5,000 opportunities we were tracking, and um, uh, today, we are, uh, um, we are at about 1,000 clients, and we're tracking about 30,000 opportunities. The difference between today and then is 
real business intelligence, actionable business intelligence right. that we're going to share on the show that the viewing audience and our clients can can act on and, and, so and make decisions. That's why you're on the show, and that's how our audience is going to benefit from it. Yes. Exactly. I think that's why you're here. here. Rich okay. content, uh, tips, perspectives, yeah. Yeah. insight, opportunities, uh, trends, all the all that kind of information that we're going to share with your viewing audience. Yeah. And by the way, I've seen some of this data firsthand. It's it's very impressive, and it's also usable and very timely and current. You know, in fact. Um, just uh, a few weeks ago, we released our analysis of the President's budget request. Mm -hmm. And a $1.24 trillion discretionary spending budget request, very insightful. Viewing audience can download that. Go to our website, centurionresearch.com, download it. It's full of a wealth of information. Yeah. And we look forward in, in future episodes to you know, talking about that and exploring the richness of that data. Okay, Gary, so we, we understand a little bit about Centurion's background and I would ca call it your mission, your motivation while you're doing business, which in many ways in the end is to help companies win work. And by the way, we, we share that in common to the, right, right. to the nth degree. And I know you have a lot of data, you were just sort of mentioning a little bit of it, and I know that you tweak it and massage it and consort it and analyze it and interpret it and explain it to us laymen what it really means. So I know you have a number of different products and services we talked about. So I'm going to I'm going to run through a couple of these of the applications, uh, and if you could just maybe explain for our audience uh, the the utility, why it matters for them, why it cares, why it will, why it will benefit them, what what does it do? I think sure, that's part sure. of it. Okay, so is that all right? We'll oh, start yeah, with that. Yeah, okay, so yeah. let's start with one, opportunity alerts. So opportunity alerts. You know, when you when we look at opportunities, we, they're they're kind of going to different buckets. Uh -huh. You know, there might be an opportunity that we we as we went through the president's budget, did that analysis, we've right. identified some opportunities. There's actual money associated with those opportunities. There's a time frame associated with some opportunities, uh -huh. and um, we've identified those opportunity alerts. There might be others as we comb through the president's budget to identify emerging opportunities. Yeah. Uh, they may not have may not have a line item, but we may through the analysis on the budget, yeah. uh, GAO reports, uh, CBO, things coming out of the federal government uh, out of the federal government, uh, strategic plans to identify emerging opportunities. Okay. So the essence is that you're identifying a lot of these things long before everybody and their brother and sister know about it because you're out in front of that market and doing the alerts, okay? Emerging trends. I know that sounds obvious what emerging trends are, but how does that work? I mean, what is that, what's that all about? Well, em emerging trends, combination of a couple things. You've got, you've got street talk, mm -hmm. you know, so what's the buzz? And, and street talk being it could be what's going on in the economy. Mm -hmm. What's that going to do uh, to the federal government? How does it impact the federal government? We're seeing a lot of that right now. Then you've got the plans that uh, agencies are making. Then you've got actions that they are they're actually implementing certain things. And when you look at the data in the past and you pull all that together, you can predict and bring some level of, of, of predictability in an uncertain market to the table. That's what we're trying to do, especially today, right, right. because it's a very, very different market. And so we've, you and I have talked uh, off camera before about uh, what, we are, what we're calling uh, what's hot. So how about sharing with our audience what you, know, what you mean by that and how sure. you'll help us in that area? Sure. You, yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you know me. I've, yeah. I've, I've got my data, uh -huh. and so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to refer to a couple of things. But you know, when you look at what's hot, you know, uh, healthcare IT is very hot. Yeah. Uh, in VA, VA is a top priority for the president. You know, how can he provide world-class care for our wounded warriors? Top, top priority. You look at cybersecurity, that's another one. Huge, huge, huge priority. $13 billion for uh, cybersecurity IT, which makes up about 16% of the IT budget of $82 billion. I mean, these are, these are very, very hot markets. Okay, so Gary, we've talked uh, about Centurion and its its business line and what you all do, and we've talked about how our audience is going to benefit from the superb work that you do. Uh, we've also talked about some of the things in future weeks that um, uh, that you're going to bring to the show to help our audience uh, better win government contracts. So now I want to just kind of uh, step back a little bit and ask you maybe. Uh, Put it all in perspective for us in terms of some of your research of recent weeks. You've, uh, what are some of the, maybe the two or three 
uh, key things that you're finding that you think you might want to share with uh, with our audience? Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, as I, as I said, we'd uh, completed our analysis yes. of the president's budget. We found on our on our websites, internresearch.com, and download it. Available to the viewers. Uh, but you know, there's some other key opportunities that that have we combed through the and conducted the, combed through the budget, and conducted the analysis. Um, there are many opportunities. We talked about healthcare IT and VA and cybersecurity, okay. uh, big opportunities. You know, when you look at HHS, CIO, CS, a $10 billion opportunity. You know, VA, which I talked about earlier, but that's a $3.9 billion uh, budget, a 20% increase over 2013. DHS, Eagle II, a $22, $22 billion right. opportunity. Right. Uh, the energy, uh, energy department, the IT budget, $24.8 billion. That's a $1.7 billion increase. There are opportunities like this throughout the president's budget. Well, I was going to say, I know you've analyzed the, the budget. The ink is hardly dry on it, and you found some things that, that maybe are not generally known to the to the government contracting community. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. I, yeah. I, I kind of, I, you know, what I love about this program, you know, I love that term, and which I picked up on your program, news you can use. Yeah. News you can use. I love that term. So, so I've got these underlying bright spots uh -huh. in the in the president's budget, mm -hmm. and um, and and on the surface maybe it looks like they're not so not so hot. SBA's budget was slashed fifty percent. Yeah, people say SBA's on the you know is on a uh, sort of a spiral downwards. You're saying the, what? the IT budget, however, yeah. Yeah. Um, only went down 02 percent from thirteen to fourteen. But that's not the good news. Here's the good news. The good news is from two thousand twelve. To 2014, it increased over 11 percent. Okay, so that's a bright spot. What's another one? Give me another, give one, another one. Another one. Be education. Education is another bright spot. Between 13 and 14, the budget was basically neutral. But when you look at comparing 2012 to 2014, that budget increased over 10 percent. Okay. So what you're saying really is that despite all the talk of austerity, there are there is some silver lining that people can be aware of and, and act on, and I think that's what you're going to bring to the show. And that's what we're going to try to bring to the yeah. show. You know. Good. Another one that uh, President, so President Obama, it's a top priority for him. He's investing an additional $50 billion in transportation. That budget went down 44%. But it's still $50 billion. $50 billion, billion. Yeah. to improve the nation's infrastructure. So that's an example of some of the uh, research and content and sort of, sort of forecasting I think we're going to get from Centurion. So once again, like I said at the very beginning, we're, we're very proud, very happy that you're on the show. I can't wait to uh, share with our audience a lot of these different perspectives and analytics that you bring to bear because frankly we've done our, we did our own research and you're best in the market. So well thank you, I appreciate you. that. Thanks very much Jim. Okay. I hope you benefited from watching today's installment of Government Contracting Weekly. I want to once again thank Ed Marche from Level 3 for sharing his insights on winning and also welcome Centurion Research Solutions. We look forward to adding their actionable data to our program each and every week. And we hope you'll be with us next week for Government Contracting Weekly. You've been watching Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored each week by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. For additional information, comments, questions, or suggestions, please write us at governmentcontractingweekly.com.